you'll find that it's all about content that agents that are doing a lot of deals are actually using in the marketplace. We don't have these polished speakers that are going to try and have a tear come out of your eye. These people here are going to tell you what they do, how they do it, when they do it, why they do it. They're going to show you examples of it in action, and then it's going to allow a real estate agent to say, I'll copy that. I'm back at my office on Tuesday and I'll do that. I think that's what's special about this program. You're listening to Elevate, the official podcast of Elite Agent Magazine for real estate industry sales professionals, property managers and leaders. Each episode, we bring you behind the scenes coaching, news analysis, exclusive interviews, technology and more to help you list more, sell more and elevate your results. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe. Every winner was once a beginner. Don't build a billboard in the forest. Don't turn a bad day into a bad year. If you didn't get who is our guest this week on the podcast from the earlier grab, that should give you a very big hint. Of course, it's Tom Panos, who will be once again hosting Arik this year up on the Gold Coast. And today we're going to give you a little bit of insider info on all the speakers on the bill this year. Find out what some of the successful agents are doing in a slower market. And we're going to hit him up with some of our Leadership Diaries questions. So welcome to the podcast, Tom Panos. Thank you, Sam. Pumped to be here. Awesome. So first of all, still the king of the Sunday night rant. Am I going to need to duck for cover at all this morning or are you going to give us a bit of the softer Tom No, Panos? you're lucky, Sam. I've got sinusitis <laughs> and I think I took, you know, those Sudafets and for some reason I think I may have taken one daytime one and one nighttime one so you might find <laughs> a little bit more passive than normal. All right, that's good. So you've just gotten off a plane too from overseas yeah. and you've just had a speaking tour of New Zealand. Yeah. What are some of the things you're seeing the best agents do around the world right now? What they're doing is adapting and understanding the language, the dialogue, the processes and the systems that they were using in the last three years. They're totally redundant. They're expired, Sam. So what I've noticed is that the really good estate agents have started to mirror what the consumer of 2019 wants. And one of the biggest things in Australia and New Zealand is we've got this big gap between what a vendor wants and what a buyer's prepared to pay. And all of a sudden, we're seeing for the first time in many years, a real estate agent having to do proper real estate work. Warren Buffett said it once, when the tide goes out, that's when you work out who's been swimming naked and who's been swimming with their bathers on. And I think what's happening, Sam, is we're getting a lot of truth coming out. People are leaving real estate and what we're watching is the good ones are really getting serious about going pro and mastering their craft. So if we were to focus on the 80-20 rule, like if 20% of your activities give you 80% of your results, yeah. what are the 20% of activities right now that agents should be focusing on? Super lengthy and strong crucial conversations with current vendors, reminding vendors, hey, yes, maybe your property's gone down 15, 20%, but I want to remind you, it's gone up 70% in five years. You're still 50% ahead. Hey, I know you're not getting the price that you want, but I want you to understand the house that you're going to buy next is actually going to be much cheaper as well. So your position is neutral. So everything's the same. So one of the things is crucial conversations with an owner. The second thing is I'm noticing that the really good ones are actually investing in their business and they're understanding here is a golden opportunity to increase market share. And what I mean by that, Sam, is this. I think you might have to accept there's less turnover. You might have had to accept that prices have come down a bit, so you're going to make a little bit less money because even your commissions per deal is going to drop. But what the good ones are saying is, hey, I'm not going to settle for actually having a lower income on my group certificate. What I'm going to do is I'm going to increase my market share. So how do I do that? Well, maybe I've got to work longer. Maybe I've got to work more intelligent. Maybe I've got to take advantage of the fact that there are other agents in my area that are leaving. Sam, that's one of the positive things. This is my 31st year in real estate. Four corrections I've seen. In those four corrections, this is what I notice. Agents leave real estate. That's a good thing. It means that for the amount of people that are left, 
there is more properties for them to turn over. The other thing I see when a marketplace corrects is people participate in fear. They seem to get myopic and scared. I think the really good ones are now working on their psychology more than ever because you've got to accept it, whether it's the media, print media, whether it's the news, whether it's radio, whether it's other agents, everyone is saying the same thing. The market has had it. Now, if you participate in that conversation, you'll end up thinking and acting as if there's nothing I can do, it's the market. But I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing real estate agents. I'm seeing a lot of my real estate gym members, Josh Tosselin, which I know you carried a story. Josh Tosselin, I'm seeing people that are, you know, 23 years of age riding a million dollars. I'm looking at people like Tom Hector. In one month he did last year, 30 sales, right? He's one of the Eric speakers. So what I'm seeing happening right now, Sam, is that there's this big gap happening and it appears now Real estate is becoming truly the highest paid hard work and the lowest paid easy work. There's this big divide happening. Now, other things I'm seeing, Sam, in this marketplace is the following. I'm seeing all of a sudden you've got to stand out to win out. And what I'm seeing is great real estate agents are adapting to the following. What they're doing is they're learning the art of using social media, but not posting their avocado sandwich. They're sitting there like, you know, like seriously, another person in your marketplace doesn't need to know what you're having for breakfast. So what are the intelligent ones doing? They're being content creators or content curators in solving a problem in their marketplace. So what am I seeing good agents doing on social? Picking up a mobile phone, sitting outside a house that they've just listed, just sold, had been sitting on the market with another agent for three months, and they'll give it a story and a case study. We listed this. It had been on the market for three months. We went in there. We made these recommendations. Stylists, sort that out. Handyman, spend $500, make all those little things that need touch-ups, fix them up. Find out where are buyers buying property that buy in Haberfield? Where are they coming from? Oh, they're coming from Newtown. Oh, they're coming from the eastern suburbs. Okay, let's get smart. Let's target it. Some social media advertising. How old are they? Oh, 30 to 40, 30 to 45. Okay, let's put some budget there and start aiming for people in that demographic in that location to come and look at this property. And then they'll post a video and they'll show a case study. Because right now, Sam, there is a lot of vendors that are sitting there, nothing happening on their property. They see a post of an agent that's actually solved a problem. That's what good agents are doing. They're not selling. They're solving problems in this new market. Totally. You're still out on the road on Saturdays doing auctions and things like that. And, you know, to be honest, we've stopped reporting that headline auction number on a Monday morning because I'm finding more and more it's meaningless with the different markets around the country. What are you seeing in your auctions? The clearance rate is lower on the day. Yeah. I'm definitely seeing less auctions, Sam. So there's a tendency that real estate agents are moving away from using the auction method as their preferred method. I'm seeing that there is a large amount of properties that are being withdrawn. I'm seeing real estate agents are saying to me, the ones that are listed by auction still have a better success rate within three weeks post the auction than their private treaties. So they are telling me that. But the landscape of auction has changed. I have to say to you, I have a lot of auctioneers who I'd never spoke to or I'd had very, not a strong relationship. Maybe I'd spoken to them four or five times in their life. They're ringing me up saying, is there any work? Is there any work? So obviously in the world of auctions, auctioneers are affected. Real estate agents aren't using it as the preferred method. I think you're doing the right thing of, you know, not spending too much on focusing on that number. I've always thought to myself, the significance of an auction number, well, look, Real estate agents, to me, generally, if they weren't being sold, a lot of the times, wouldn't be actually 
taking the phone call to the company that was collecting the data mm. because they'd rather have no information than an unsold. So I've always thought to myself, how accurate is a clearance rate that's published on the weekend? Well, exactly. And it's like you were saying a bit earlier, like I'm hearing the good agents are still clearing 84%, like on lower numbers, obviously. But when you sort of got a headline number of sub 50, it means nothing to the people, you know, in Geelong and places like that that are still doing pretty well. Correct, correct. So this is weird too. It's like a whole year since our auction roundtable. Yes. And was that this yeah, time last like year? Yeah, it was this time last year. In fact, probably about a year to the day right. almost. And things have changed significantly. The other thing that's coming up very, very soon is ARIC. Yeah. ARIC 2019 up on the Gold Coast. We're here to get a bit of the insider goss from you actually about ARIC because there's a few people on the speaker list that we haven't really heard of before. So can you give us a bit of a rundown of who's speaking at the event this year? Okay, so the one guy that caught my eye right from the outset is a guy called James Clear, and I know that you've covered him, Sam. I subscribe to him, yeah. Yeah, so I'm a major believer that process trumps motivation. Mm. I think that there is a tendency that you go to a two-day course and you get inspired, but I also know that there is a large group of people that do go back to their office and within about 10 days, they revert back to their old habits. And what James Clear talks about is how to actually have a process-driven life and how habits work and how to actually engrave and hardwire certain behaviours. So I'm really looking forward to James Clear, the author of the book Atomic Habit. Scott Duncan is a guy that John McGrath really wanted to get out because he's core message is how to deliver tough conversations and Mm. negotiations. And that's needed in this marketplace, Sam. That's needed in this marketplace. So people like that, I'm really looking forward to. But one of the great things about the ARIC program in 2019 is it involves real estate agents that not necessarily have a GCI of five or $10 million, but there are people there that are doing 100, 200 deals. I mean, for instance, Shari from Barry Plan in Geelong. I think the guy did 250 sales. Mm. And I think that the audience is saying, hey, listen, we love seeing the rock star person with the five or 10 million GCI. We like that. It's aspirational. We like the term multi-million dollar agent. But what we also want to hear is people that are doing low price brackets, a lot of transactions, a lot of work, How do they do that? How do they have the capacity to transact that much amount of property? And I think that this ARIC program has got that because it's got people like Shari and it's got people like Tommy Hector, as I said earlier on, 30 sales. And then you've got your other big riders, like, you know, one of the top people in Ray Wide throughout the world, David Walker, who I would say is one of the best real estate agents on the planet, writes a few million bucks a year. Then you've got Daniel Gonzalez. Daniel Gonzalez, like this guy in a matter of three or four years has become a $3 million rider in the hardest marketplace in Australia, Perth. Sam, then Michael Pallia. People would argue and say that he'd probably be, over the last 20 years, the highest GCI person in Australia. There would be no one that would come close to him over the last two decades. The fact that we've got lots of female agents, like I think the program is around 40% females, and that includes some of the panels, Cindy Kennedy, Georgie Bates. So there's some great specialist speakers, but I'm really looking forward to seeing some of these agents that the average agent in Australia and New Zealand can relate to. Because I think what happens sometimes, Sam, is there's this big gap. People saying, my house market is 500,000. I don't sell in a $4 million market. Mm. I can't write those numbers. What this program is going to show you is how to write those numbers in your own market, which might be a $500,000 market. Interestingly, there's a couple of agents on that SQM list, which I kind of rate as a very credible list, one of the few really credible lists out there in the industry. Malik Unin, really humble guy. For anyone listening to the podcast, Lisa Totaro, she was the only female in the top 10 on the SQM list. And she's actually going to be on our cover next issue because we always have an Eric speaker on the cover. And, you know, know what, Tom? I rang her and said, you know, like, 
we always put an Eric speaker on the cover. And this year we'd like to feature you because you were, you know, the only female on the top 10 list. And she said, what list are you talking about? She's so humble that she had no idea what I was talking about and even that it was such a big achievement. You're 100% right. Most of these real estate agents have flown under the radar. Most of these have been gym members or are current gym members, and I know them. And they're people that you don't see on lots of brochures flying around the place. But there's a classic example when you're talking about someone who's just so busy doing her stuff, hasn't really ever spent too much time filling in application forms for, you know, Going awards and all of that. They're just trying to provide incredible value, building an incredible career in their marketplace. And that's what people are going to be hearing at Arrow. I'm really happy to see Sonia Trelaw on the list this year. She was on our cover a couple of years ago if anyone remembers the pink suit. She started in real estate later on in life and has just done an amazing job. Like now she's got her own office and everything like that. So it'd be really interesting to hear how her journey's gone since since we last caught up with her. She's a wonderful person in in challenging times I've had. I mean, Sonia Trelaw every fortnight contacts me and has just religiously, how are you going? There's no something, not trying to get something out of me. And I really rate that in people when they contact you and there's nothing that they're looking for. And Sonia law she's had her own challenges and I love stories where I see people that have had challenging past turn their life around and eight years I think she's been in real estate now one of the leaders in the Ray White group she's going to be fantastic lots of great girls there Rumor Mundy you know Steve Cobar from New Zealand who was working on the gym program with me in New Zealand last week another guy so we've got Kiwis coming as well so June 1 June 2 isn't it Sam June 1 June June 2 and so is there anything else I mean we've got a few special things planned for Eric this year like we're already plotting and scheming now and you've probably seen a couple of them out there on the way in is there anything else unique that you think will happen at this event is the auction competition are we so the auction competition was a hit last year. Mm. So the auction competition is also going to be happening. And we know that some things work and some things don't. That worked, you know. So the template and the formula that Eric is using this year is similar to previous years. Eric has been a very strong event for a long period of time. There's a lot of other events, Sam, that happen now in the world of real estate training, as we were talking off air before. But the one thing is for around a thousand bucks, you go away for two days to a nice place. You have the opportunity to realign your agreement with reality and come back. Difficult to do that sitting in front of YouTube. Difficult to do that on your own. There's a sense of energy that comes when you get information and being in a different location where you somehow meditate on your business and say to yourself, you know what? I can be better. And you do have to be better. So what I would say the biggest difference this year's program, I think the template's the same, but I think, Sam, the biggest difference would be that you'll find that it's all about content that agents that are doing a lot of deals are actually using in the marketplace. We don't have these polished speakers that are going to try and have a tear come out of your eye. These people here are going to tell you what they do, how they do it, when they do it why they do it. They're going to show you examples of it in action and then it's going to allow a real estate agent to say, I'll copy that, I'm back at my office on Tuesday and I'll do that. I think that's what's special about this program. And the people that do go to ARIC, what do they do after the event that makes implementation successful? Like what would be your major tip for implementation post-conference? My major tip would be... Factor in, it's going to be hard. Change is hard, Sam. Mm. I mean, let's be clear. I make a living out of real estate telling people what they already know but don't do, (laughs) right? I would be unemployed in the real estate industry if that issue didn't exist. Change is damn hard. If change was easy, I think everyone would be a multi-million dollar agent living in a $5 million house, would be totally fit, would have the perfect relationship, would be driving a $300,000 Tesla or whatever car they want to be driving, would be holidaying six weeks a year. Change is damn hard. So what I'd say to people is leave Eric, number one, accept it's going to be hard when you implement changes. 
Step number two, get myopic about one or two game changers, not 15 or 20 strategies. Number three, 80% of winning is just beginning. Don't worry about the fifth strategy. Worry about what you're going to do next because success is a domino effect. You leave Eric, you come back, hypothetically speaking. Let's assume that one strategy you pick up at Eric is that what I will do is I will prospect for 90 minutes before lunchtime. Simple as that. You turn around and say, I'll do nothing else. I'm going to incorporate 90 minutes before lunchtime every day. Here's what I'd do. I would find an accountability partner and I would say that you will ring that person up every day at five o'clock. And every day at five o'clock that you haven't done that, you EFT them a hundred bucks. So you actually have a consequence for lack of behavior. So create a consequence for when you don't do it because what you're trying to do is engrave this pattern in your head that before lunchtime every day, I do 90 minutes. When I don't do it at five o'clock, I'm up for a hundred bucks. The next thing I would do is work out not just your to-do list. I think a lot of people have to sort of leave Eric with the stuff not to do. Mm. Hypothetically speaking, maybe the thing you shouldn't do is when you get to the office at nine o'clock, maybe the habit that you need to change, the pattern is, oh, I go have a coffee with one of my colleagues at nine o'clock. Because what happens is nine o'clock becomes 10.30. Mm. And then you come back and then you're thinking, but lunch is in around 90 minutes. Maybe you need to have a new operating pattern that says, when I get to the office at nine o'clock, I get a coffee, I put it on my table, and within one minute, I pick up the phone and make my first call. What you're talking about there is a system change. Like if you think about your morning as a system, yeah. instead of just saying to yourself, well, I'm going to make a hundred calls in the next half hour, yeah. that's like I will change my system to have a cup of coffee and then go to my desk and pick up the phone. Like Correct. Sam, systems drive people life whether they like to believe it or not. Mm. I mean, systems, like some people have got a system. I don't know. You go to dinner. Some people that are religious, they have dinner, sit down at the table, or we do our prayer. Yeah. That's a system. Yeah. One other thing I was taught over Christmas, which kind of changed my life, is looking at my to-do list, which is sometimes very long. I think to myself on every item, what will happen if I do this and what will happen if I don't do this? Good question. You often find that you can cross those things off pretty quickly if the outcome of something is not worth it. Yeah, people have got this addiction to have lists with ticks next to them. <laughs> Makes them feel good. I do like a good tick. <laughs> All right. So, guys, we're going to have some links in the show notes and things like that for your ARIC tickets. Both Tom and I have got great discounts on ARIC tickets for real estate gym members and also for elite agent members. So we'll leave links for those in the show notes. Now, lastly, Tom, I promised the guys I would hit you up with our Leadership Diaries questions because our leadership issue is coming out next. So you ready? Absolutely. Let's go. What was your first job before real estate and what did it teach you? First job was working at Luna Park as the wizard. You were a wizard at Luna Park. I was a wizard at Luna. Luna Park is actually nearby where we are now, isn't it? It's yeah, like very close, yeah. yeah. So at school, I got a job at Luna Park and I was working the dodgems. There was a guy who was the wizard. On the second or third day of my job there, the wizard had a fight with the supervisor, <laughs> took his wizard hat off. Someone yelled out, mate, come over here, put the uniform on, and I became the wizard. And that was my job at Luna Park. And what used to happen, Sam, was people would come on over and I would have to guess their month within three months of when they were born, their age within five years, or their weight within two stones. So I had those three things. They would buy a ticket. And then if I lost, they would win a prize. They'd pick a prize. Now, the prize were like stuffy toys and they weren't that expensive. So at the end of the day, we just wanted to sell tickets. What did I learn? 
make people feel good about their age. <laughs> 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 I, I was going to say, I might have known you had some cool job like that. That you were never going to be the guy that was working for a supermarket. Fifteen or, or sixteen or years of age. Like I was at the. I, I can't believe I was the wizard, and I loved the job. And then I threw my hat in as well. What's the most important thing you're working on right now, and how you're making it happen? My number one thing is the real estate gym. And the reason why, Sam, is, and I'm at the stage like I'm 51, Sam. You know, what I mean, like I've had a terrible track record with health. You don't uh, look a day over fabulous, Tom. I've, I've had a terrible track record with health and I don't know, like, let's assume that I never get cancer ever again, right? Fingers crossed. If I live to 75 or 80, I'm two-thirds or, you know, I'm more than halfway through my life. So all of a sudden you think to yourself, impact, impact, legacy, you know, so that's where I'm at with life. Mm. Can you name someone who's had a big impact on you as a leader? I like talking about this topic, Sam, because that's what I did for 15 years in the corporate world. Every boss that I had either taught me things that I should do or taught me things I shouldn't do. One of the things that I learned from my good bosses is you get what you tolerate. So don't put up with shit, right? You get what you tolerate. I learned that. I also have learned that you should fundamentally take the approach that people are doing the best they can. Because when you take that approach, Sam, it says to you, hey, they're not lazy, they're not dumb, they're not bad people. Based on where they are in their life right now and with the resources you've given them, they're doing the best they can. What can I do to help that person as a leader? Who are you learning from right now? Some of it comes via Audible. Most of my learning, I have to tell you, Sam, in the last 12 months has come through life events. I learned through life events there's this term called the black swan. And the black swan is, you know, when the English people came to Australia many years ago, they saw a black swan and they were shocked because all swans were white. If you look at the meaning in the dictionary of black swan or when you Google it, it's an unforeseen event that changes the way you look at life forever. The death of my brother that's a black swan moment. Other people's black swan moments are a divorce or a bad diagnosis or a financial breakdown. To me, my biggest learnings is as you landscape through life, what actually happens is you go into a storm, you come out of the storm, the person that comes out of the storm is a different person that walked into the storm. So what's my biggest learning? Life. Is there anything you're afraid to do or would do if you weren't afraid? Skydive. Everyone says that. Hang gliding I did in Queenstown, right? And I thought to myself, hey, could I do that? What if there was a stuff up there? That comes to my head. Mind you, as humans, you know, the whole thought of jumping out of a plane must drive our lizard brains absolutely crazy because we're not meant to fly. Correct. It's It's not natural. It's not natural. It's not natural. What's the worst leadership advice you've ever heard given to someone and why? Don't worry about those guys in the room. They're dead wood. I'll never forget that. I went to do a workshop for a real estate client and the principal, there was about 40 people in the room and he just whispered in my ear, see those guys on that side of the room? Don't worry about them. They're dead wood. And I just replied, were they dead when you hired them or did you kill them? Which is basically you either recruited badly or you actually made them bad because they were good to start off with. I just think that people that make assumptions like that about staff is not a good thing. Okay, last question. If there's one thing that you would like everyone to remember as a result of this chat today, this interview, what would it be? I know it sounds weird coming from someone that's supposed to be upbeat. Fundamentally, I think that life is challenging. I think that life is suffering. You're going to bury people you love and you're going to have, you know, black swan moments in your life. So one of the best things that you can do as a human being is if you've got an opportunity to do a random act of kindness to a stranger, do it. You might be the only person that actually does it. And there's something special about helping another person. It is called helpers high. You'll feel better. The person feels better. And it just makes life a little bit more bearable for both parties. Mm, There's nothing like putting a smile on someone else's dial to put one on your own. Yeah, you just make them smile. You smile on the inside. Couldn't agree with you more, Tom Panels. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. To subscribe to the magazine, visit eliteagent.com.au forward slash subscribe.